Welcome to Taiwan Report Headlines. I'm your host, Chan Su, for October 30th, 2020. By the time we're recording this, it's already Halloween. So happy Halloween to all of you out there. Just to let you guys know, for those of you who haven't been in Taiwan for a long time, I've noticed this year there have been more and more Halloween decorations versus previous years. Usually, Halloween decorations were mainly limited to certain clubs and bars or those frequented by expats. However, this year things have changed a lot as a lot of random stores from restaurants to you name it that are frequented by locals have been putting up Halloween decorations as well. Not every last one of them, just more than before. So first off, some good news. This article from the Financial Times titled Virus Success Tips Taiwan to Best Growth Among Developed Economies. This article was by Catherine Hill in Taipei, and it basically talks about how Taiwan has been doing better, having a 3.3% jump in GDP in the third quarter, which has been the fastest rate in more than two years. Some of it attributed to the fact that a lot of people in Taiwan felt very safe and there hasn't been any lockdown in Taiwan, domestic consumption has increased, and of course the demand for electronics and equipment has really helped Taiwan's exports because people abroad are buying web cams or laptops or other pieces of electronics equipment, which has only helped Taiwan's industry further. Now, in terms of domestic consumption, they're actually quite accurate because I had been traveling quite a bit around Taiwan. And I've noticed in the past few months that whenever there was a common holiday, a lot of hotels would be booked I would see huge crowds. I've never seen them in such numbers all over the place. Even now, some of my favorite hotels are much more expensive than normal. A related article is from the Wall Street Journal titled Taiwan Shrugs Off Pandemic to Deliver Surprise Growth, end quote, by Chao Deng. This article is unfortunately behind a paywall, but generally gives the same information as the previously mentioned. In news related to yesterday, when I mentioned the military holding ceremonies for same-sex couples, well, they've married on Friday. And Taiwan is still the only place in Asia to have legalized same-sex marriage. Of course, it's not perfect, as Nick Aspinwall notes in his fantastic article in The Diplomat, titled, Taiwan has brunch with Tsai after her LGBT support angers prayer breakfast organizers. There usually is a national prayer breakfast that happens annually. This year, it was supposed to be October 30th, 2020, today. However, it was canceled. The organizers are Christian, and they did not like the fact that President Tsai Ing-wen made a post supportive of Taiwan's LGBTQ plus community. Last weekend, she made a tweet encouraging people to join Taiwan Pride. Taiwan Pride happens this year to fall under the same day as Halloween. Now, Taiwan Pride is the largest Asian gay parade as well. In a usual year, people from all around Asia will come and show up. It will also be probably the only annual LGBT pride held around the world because of the pandemic. And this is where the Taiwan Times has a fantastic article about this. If you are curious about the history of Taiwan pride, the title of the article is 2020 Taiwan LGBT Pride, October 31st, All You Need to Know, by Catherine Wang. And in it, the history of Taiwan Pride. For instance, the first one was held on November 1st, 2003. However, the government uh, back then criticized it. They said it was an obscenity. Well, in 2004, there was another Pride anyway. In 2005, yet another. And it kept going on and on and on. Ame, the queen of Mando Pop, was one of the first spokespersons for Taiwan Pride. And with that, they had a big boost. And this was in 2007. Anyway, for more of the history, that's a fantastic article. I love how it goes into the history of things. The parade itself will happen at the Taipei City Hall Square, starting from 11.30 a.m. and ending at 6.40 there's a lot of information online all over Facebook.
Now, going back to Tai Ing Wen and how the Christian organizations were offended, it's because she had encouraged people to join this parade. And as a result, they were unhappy. I do think there is a demographics difference. Uh, a lot of the younger people are in full support of LGBTQ plus rights. However, some of the Christian organizations, a lot of them somewhat older, are definitely not. And at the same time, the Taiwanese military held the mass wedding on Friday, which included two lesbian couples. Now, this happens one day before Taiwan's annual Pride Parade. So the Christian groups decided to make a petition demanding that President Tsai not come. Well, the result is that she decided not to show. But on the other hand, the gay community, as well as Taiwan's Twitter and internet sphere, immediately reacted. They started with using a hashtag. And that hashtag was Pei Xiaoying Tsi Zao Chan, which means having brunch with President Tsai. And it had featured people taking photos of them having breakfast, uh, putting that hashtag while showing words of support. On Twitter, you'll see all sorts of pictures, a lot of them with delicious Taiwanese meals. Some of them were Western meals, but the vast majority were Taiwanese staple breakfasts. So, in effect, tons of people had virtual breakfasts with the president in a show of support. And for further context, Nick Aspinwall's fantastic article does mention how there was a referendum in 2018 which used confusingly worded referendums in order to get the public to vote against making same-sex marriage legal. So in response, the legislature ultimately passed a law that didn't quite touch the civil code, but still complied with the Taiwan's high court ruling to make same-sex marriage legal. And though the high court were made up of judges that were stacked that way by the Thai administration. So a lot of background maneuvering involved to make this possible. Tsai Ing-wen has used rather conservative or creative measures to push through bills that she's personally wanted in a roundabout manner, especially because her tactics have to be that way due to the way Taiwan's government is. Even though the DPP currently controlled the legislature, there's still a lot of problems because the Democratic Progressive Party is more of an alliance as opposed to a hierarchy. And as a result, she does not or is not exactly able to lay down orders like a tyrant or boss or something of that sort, but she has to negotiate with people. Now, for people who live in districts with a high concentration of Christians, there is very little benefit to vote for uh, pro-LGBT measures, which is a reality that the numbers of people in the gay community are not strong enough. That said, among youth, there is a fantastic number of LGBT support. I'm not sure if there's enough polls to back this up, but if you go to any business or cafe that's run by people under 35, you almost certainly will see some banner or rainbow flag or something showing their support. Although, sadly, some of their numbers did decline after the 2018 referendum as some businesses sought to protect themselves. But the reality is it's still widely seen all over the place, at least here in Taipei and places I've been to in Hualien and Kaohsiung even. In related news to the Taipei Pride Parade, Taipei City announced on Tuesday that it will be part of the Rainbow Cities Network. And this is covered by a Taiwan News article titled, Taipei is the first city in Asia to join global LGBT organization, which is fantastic as Taiwan expands and it becomes more, and Taipei especially, becomes more of a global city, measures like these are becoming more apparent. Notably, Taipei has had rainbow crosswalks in Ximending, and now you could see some of them, at least the streets painted in rainbow colors, near Taipei City Hall. Another article that I really loved was by Brian Cho from the News Lens. It was titled, what can Taiwan learn from South Korea in recruiting migrant workers? 
the subtitle being, what kind of country does Taiwan want to be? And it's a feature article that really talks about Taiwan's Employment Service Act and what they do in order to help workers that come from Southeast Asia. Now, one of Taiwan's biggest long-term problems is a brokerage system. There has been laws to help encourage Taiwan to have a similar licensing system as South Korea, but there are issues because sometimes brokers are still used. I personally don't want to ruin it, but I strongly encourage you to read this article. Reason being because even though Taiwan is a manufacturing center for semiconductors and so on and so forth, but Taiwan still very much is dependent on migrant workers from Southeast Asia. They are often seen in factories down in Kaohsiung or Taichung, and they work very hard. I do believe Taiwan should show them more respect. Now, does this mean that nobody does? That's not true. There are a lot of rights groups in Taiwan that really try to do that. However, the reality is there is racism and bias in Taiwan against some of these workers. Just a couple years ago, there was a village somewhere in Taiwan if memory serves, that didn't want the building of a small dormitory for a construction site because migrant workers might live there. They had said that they didn't want any crime or uh, sex crimes and among other things to happen in their village. This was highly racist and widely condemned by a lot of people all around Taiwan. So it's not like this went unchallenged. That said, it's still important to acknowledge that we're all still working on this. And of course, the migrant workers have protests every year asking for better rights. I do believe they should have equal rights and they are supposed to be offered protections. Taiwan's labor rights hotline does come in many different languages to help cover this. But there's still room for improvement. Sometimes employers will cut wages or extend working holidays as much as they liked, or migrant workers may feel powerless and be forced to work seven days a week when the law says they should absolutely get one day off. But sometimes those days are taken or the scope of their jobs are dramatically expanded way beyond what they were promised. Regardless, articles like these will help improve Taiwan's labor system because attention onto that will help. Again, Taiwan is highly dependent on migrant labor, so finding systems in order to improve upon it will make Taiwan attract the very best to come help us out because Taiwan cannot do it alone. In somewhat amusing news, The Drive reports that Taiwan disguises armored vehicles as cranes and scrap heaps during urban warfare maneuvers. This is because this week was Combat Readiness Week. So working on all sorts of ways in order to prepare Taiwan against potential invasion. So one of the images consists of a Taiwanese tank made to look like a construction vehicle, a yellow construction vehicle at that. So from the sky or satellites, it might be convincing. Other vehicles were covered in foliage, covered to made to look like uh, buses or special trucks, uh, even though they were actually tanks or armored personnel vehicles. For those pictures, definitely check the article out from The Drive. Finally, the last article of the day is from ABC, the Australian ABC, not the U.S. one. And the article's title is Australia's Taiwan and Hong Kong Diaspora Conflicted About Whether They Want Donald Trump to Win the U.S. Election. This one by Bang Xiao. It's actually quite interesting because for single issue voters, especially those that care about presidential administrations that seem to be anti-China, that Trump has been seen as a very interesting character, especially if you're from Hong Kong or Taiwan. On the other hand, this article also points out several things. One, a lot of these voters also mentioned that they may not necessarily have been satisfied with Donald Trump's handling in local affairs in the United States. Now, for these people in Australia, they are saying that they don't think Donald Trump may have reacted to the pandemic with enough seriousness. Or they might say that they personally do not agree with Donald Trump in most areas, but they do agree with his anti-China stance and hope to see that continue. 
But what I found very interesting in this article is something that I've been saying for a long time as a long time U.S. Taiwan advocate, as well as United States political watcher. And it's a sub subtitled, which says Trump isn't a catalyst. Congress is. This is accurate. And this is backed in this article by Alfred Wu, an associate professor in international relations from the National University of Singapore. And he says that many pro-democracy advocates misunderstood and thought that Trump was behind the support for Hong Kong and Taiwan. But the real support, he says, was parliamentary. And this is accurate. Donald Trump has not personally passed any executive orders or requested any bills as president for supporting Taiwan. Instead, as always, and yet again, it is Congress, the United States legislature, in other words, that has been creating bills to support Taiwan or Hong Kong. Notably, uh, a lot of bills that were supporting Taiwan passed bipartisanly and with overwhelming support, so much so that Trump couldn't even have vetoed them if he wanted to. Now, the other thing, Dr. Alfred Rue also points out that he does not believe that the United States will change its position to be anti-China. I personally think that the biggest credit goes to Xi Jinping for his assertiveness, especially in his speeches and behavior, has made China seem more of a threat. The pandemic has only ensured that basically all sides are seeing that China is a dramatic danger. That, coupled with wolf warrior diplomacy, which is a very brutish diplomatic methodology that China has been promoting, the wolf warrior name coming from a movie that has been popular and flames Chinese nationalism. So essentially, Chinese diplomats would run around uh, saying things or even doling out threats like they did recently to Canada, uh, has been been met with a lot of backlash. So Congress, again, as usual, seems to be the one that are passing these bills in support of Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now, some people who may not really understand how the United States government works may assume that it is Donald Trump behind these moves. When in fact, if you look at the politicians or the Congress persons who have passed these bills, tend to be in the Taiwan caucus or China caucus. And the China caucus being unique in that it is anti-China. So the combination of all these things means that there is a lot of room for misunderstanding. And do I think it may matter whoever becomes the future president of the United States? Personally, my analysis says probably not. The United States is more likely to continue the course. Trump says he will continue his unilateral approach against China, whereas Biden says he will use more of a global coalition. Well, we'll see what happens in the coming days as the United States election happens on November 3rd. Well, that rounds about the news for Taiwan. Hopefully you had a little fun. Please have a great and safe happy Halloween. Just one more thing. I wanted to thank all of our patrons and backers. You guys have made all of this possible and we're grateful. Donovan is working on some new shows, new current affairs Taiwan, Michael Turton has been working on new Taiwan Context shows. There's a lot more coming, so we'll let you guys know all about it, and we can't wait to share. Until next time. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw.